Hello, and welcome to our FOSDEM panel on free and open source software and hardware. Um, I am, uh, for people who know me, you won't be surprised that this is an issue that is very near to my heart. Um, as a patient and lawyer, I care deeply about free and open source software and having access to my own medical device and control over it, but also that we as a public have control over it. We have assembled a group of awesome experts in this field, and I can't wait for, um, for us to have this fantastic conversation. So I'm just going to um, call on each of you to introduce yourselves, um, and I'll just uh, do it in the order I see you on in my screen. So Adriana, could you go first? Yeah, and, hi, thank uh, you. And just talk about like who you are, what you're working on, and just make it like a, a, very, a brief introduction. Okay, so not just favorite colors and name, but also what I'm working. All right, so hi, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Adriana. I'm running the Prototype Fund in Germany. It's a funding program for innovative so um, open source software. We're part of the Open Knowledge Foundation, and we are 100% financed by the Federal Ministry for Education and Research. So it's also public money, public code. Um, and with the Prototype Fund, we're not focusing solely on innovation. We're like not a startup uh, fund, but we focus on innovative open source software with, um, you know, that's in the general interest or the public interest. So we fund projects um, in the fields of human rights or, you know, for more um, control over your data and so on. Um, and that's that's what I do daily. But then you come across so many interesting projects that uh, sometimes you do a little side job as well. So we did one big hackathon last year um, as part of like an initial response to Corona in Germany, which was called V versus Virus, where we came up with lots of ideas uh, in the field of technology, how to not solve, but, you know, kind of like tackle the Corona crisis a little. A little bit. So I didn't mention my favorite color, but did I mention everything else now? You did a great job, but what is your favorite color? Damn it, it's green. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, I, I just discussed that I shouldn't have a green background because it's not a good look, but it's my favorite color. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, Fabio, you're up. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, so my name is Fabio. Um, I'm uh, leading Breathing Games. Uh, which is a commons uh, where we aim to co-create uh, games and devices for respiratory health. Uh, and building on that, we created the Open Village, which is a Geneva Health Forum event to bring together uh, projects that want to create uh, freely reproducible uh, equipment and software for health. Uh, and uh, maybe two, two interesting uh, things I did this uh, or last year was like, uh, I was able to um, facilitate or be part of the uh, European hackathon against COVID, where we saw that uh, there was a lot of involvement, but maybe we could have uh, brought together better ways to cooperate. And uh, I wrote a report uh, on open science in Canada. Uh, and I think we see also this move to, to try to create more open and more uh, uh, accessible science. So, yeah. Your favorite color? Uh, I'd say purple. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so, Luis. Hola, chicos, ¿cómo están? Encantado de estar con todos ustedes en estos días y realmente un placer eh, poder estar con todos. Oh, sorry. My English. <laughs> My Spanish wasn't playing well here. It's, it's, it's really a pleasure being with you guys. Uh, I know Karen and Fabio for, for some years now, and it's great to meet um, Adriana. Um, I'm a physician by training, and um, I'm the founder and president of GNU Solidario. This is an, an NGO focused on social medicine. And um, our main project is uh, GNU Health, which uh, tries to deliver health and education and social medicine. That's, that's where we put the focus. Um, so we run projects in small clinics to very large hospitals around the world. And um, if we had to mention something about the COVID, um, last year, Argentina 
adopted um, GNU Health as the um, uh, COVID observatory in, in, in some of the uh, provinces. Um, so we are very, very proud to see Libre software running on public administrations, which of course is one of our main goals. And um, I would say my favorite color is red. It's, it's, it's probably, so we have a nice rainbow today here. <laughs> Fantastic. My my favorite color is also uh, is also red. <laughs> yeah, cool. Nice. <laughs> um, so okay, so we all uh, touched on COVID, which was of course the first line of conversation of of, of questions that I really wanted to touch on now. Like, um, you know, we've seen tremendous innovation during this time of COVID. We've seen um, projects coming together, working together. We've seen, uh, you know, uh, folks working to use 3D printing for replacement valves. Um, we've seen, I think there are over a hundred uh, free and open ventilator software projects. Um, how, what is the role that you see free software um, and, and open hardware playing in the fight against COVID um, and, and, and implications for any future pandemics? Um, and and how, how, what do you, so I, well, we'll start with that, and then we'll get to what we think we should do uh, later. So, so how 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 is that plan? How how are things working out now? What are you seeing on the ground? And I think all of you probably have answers to this. So, if anyone wants to go first, just raise your hand. Otherwise, I'll just call on you. <laughs> okay, find right. you. <laughs> um, yes, I can start. Um, I feel like what uh, uh, Libre and uh, free software can. Uh, teach us is, is the way people can cooperate together and I feel we need more social change and a bit less of technological uh, uh, people uh, focusing on, on really technical solutions. Um, of course there was a, a move and a, a will for a lot of people to contribute to find solutions. For example in this European hackathon there were 20,000 people coming together for three days but we are still in a mindset where like we are in this like startup mode in this uh, competitive mode where there are thousands mm -hmm. of projects that come up uh, with little literature review with little validation with little implication of real users and i feel like for example we we, we spoke or you spoke about the respirators so there are hundreds of projects that are open source but very few that are really uh, tested within a uh, communities especially in the global south there are few people that are really involved to make this accessible to everyone even for people with low literacy so i feel like the what we can learn from from the software for from linux and, and so on is really like the way we can bring our resources together to create a few projects that are really impactful rather than multiply them Louis or Adriana? Yeah, the the hackathon in the EU that was EU versus virus. Yeah, exactly. We talked a lot um, to them, uh, especially about those points of not making it competitive because that you know, like having a prize at the end of a hackathon might be a good idea if you do it if it's like in a commercial hackathon for like some business model or like any big companies doing a hackathon. But when you want to find solutions against a pandemic to so maybe you know you know really focus um, or emphasize cooperation and not too much like trying to find the the one best project and in Germany the V versus virus we had thirty thousand participants and we made open source uh, um, we couldn't make it like we couldn't force. 30,000 people, if they do software development uh, over the weekend in the hackathon, it must be open source. But we told them, hey, do that because that's, that makes everything that follows easier. And we had like a follow up program um, where we also supported some projects financially. And in order to be part of the follow up uh, program, you, you, you needed to develop open source software. So we tried to focus on community spirit in software development, in the hackathon. And uh, it was amazing how many good ideas came came out of it. Uh, I think the toughest part is not coming up with the good idea, but then bring it 
like you know make it make it work as fast as you can so it does actually have an impact for the people during uh, the corona crisis um but i think yeah it, it in germany at least um it did show how many good ideas and how like how powerful the community is uh, just what you said you know that they can they can it's not like a nice thing some people do it can make a real mm. difference during a crisis if you trust the people empower the people and let them come up with a lot of small scale ideas that that make yeah it, at large make a huge difference yeah i i i fully agree with with fabio and and, and adrian i think that one of the key issues or, or the key benefits of of libre software is independence right it makes you independent um it gives you the flexibility that probably when you are talking about commercial vendors you don't have it um we as gnu solidario were part uh, we partner with the eu commission as a civil society for the eu versus virus and i do agree with uh, uh, adriana and i'm positive with fabio too uh, that we here are talking about cooperation. We have to really remove this sort of competitive uh, order that you see in, in, in the old commercial uh, world that they are actually, and, and, and Karen knows me, uh, I'm, I'm very, very strict on that issue. Um, you know, free software is, and libre software is a philosophy. And when you see the big corporations getting there and kind of masking up as like the nice guys trying to be solid, it's like, come on, guys, uh, we, we know each other for many years now. So it's hard to, to, to we know each other already very well. Um, and, and that independence that I was talking about, I think that that, that gives you also sovereignty, right? It, it, you, you own the system and to give you a small example, we were able to uh, add, of course, the next day WHO gave the, the ICD-10 code for COVID. We had it in New Health. And we did the contact tracing module for New Health that is actually being run in many countries today. And we didn't really have to ask anybody. It was the community who asked for that. And the community who actually coded and in just a matter of a couple of days, that was there. That flexibility and that coming together, it's what makes Libre software and Libre hardware, by the way, um, so important today, you know? Um, and it would be wonderful, wonderful, if we are able to go one step further and get that philosophy into some things like uh, pharmaceuticals, you know? The, the, we are trapped today by big pharma guys that are doing whatever they want to do and sell it to whoever they want to sell it the, the, the highest price. The Libre software is about community. And if we can have that at the state level and be the universities being um, empowered and, and being leading those type of uh, research, we probably wouldn't be as miserable as we are today in this world, right? So I guess independence and ownership and cooperation uh, are probably the three key um, aspects I would emphasize in, in the uh, Libre Software community. Now, um, this is the legal and policy dev room. So I apologize that we're gonna get in the weeds a tiny bit. Um, I want to talk a tiny bit about licensing and how that plays a role in this um, in this discussion. I I've been excited, of course, to see that during the pandemic, major corporations have moved to, as you say, Luis, look like the good guys and like trying to showing that they they're 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 willing to share and act. And it often means that they're choosing licenses, like Medtronic, for example, and one of its ventilators chose a license that wasn't. It wasn't a free license, but it was in fact um, a license that said you can use this for now. Basically, you can use this for the pandemic and not worry about it, but without granting rights freely, which is of course antithetical to free and open source software. And so, um, you know, how are 
all of you seeing licensing playing out in these discussions, are you seeing a difference in your work in terms of how people are approaching, for example, copy left? Is that a tool that, um, you know, that is making your work easier in any cases? Or do you find that, um, you know, a non copy left license, uh, you know, what, what, are, what are you seeing? So, um, Fabio, have you? Do you have any thoughts? I'm just going to, if nobody talks, I'm going to just call on you. That's the, the joy of a moderator. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not sure. I feel there is a, a bit of increased awareness about uh, the licensing issues uh, in the general public, but still very limited. Uh, there is always also this discussion whether like public domain is better than, uh, for example, a peer production license where reciprocity is needed from uh, uh, non uh, for, for from for profit organizations, for example. Um, but maybe I don't know. My colleagues have some more experience with that. Adriana, do you have any thoughts? No, I just remembered that when we asked more or less forty thousand people, so please develop. If you develop software, do it um, open source. They like many came back to us and they're like, okay, but how like what license does that mean i need to, and we were like okay like the organizational team we we're not all techie so i went back to the community uh, that we're also funding with the prototype fund and i was like do you have any advice and i think i like hell broke loose <laughs> because everybody was like you should do this and then everybody else was like no don't do that do that and i was like okay okay guys so what do i tell those people um, what should they do? And I think the issue is, of course, that there's not one size fits all. Like one one thing is the solution. It's it's very it very depends on each case. But my point is, if you encourage people who you know to develop open source software in like a medical field, and they do that, and they have great ideas, but they are not like super experienced, it's super tough for them to find out how to do this right. Um, and I think that's an important point for outside this expert bubble. There are lots of people struggling with like, I would like to do open source software, but what does that mean exactly um, if I do it? Does that mean that you have a conversations about the difference between making something freely licensed and sharing something possibly on terms that are non-free? Does that ever come up, Adriana? It, it every everything came up. It, it was especially about health data. Like people were, I think that's maybe a little German specific as well because everybody's freaking out about data security and you don't know, don't don't mess this up, otherwise you get in deep trouble. And we had lots of projects focusing on um, streamlining, you know, communication between di different um, health centers in Germany because it's really bad. They kind of fax the data. And lots of projects try to make this better, but then they ha handle very sensitive data. And they were just like, well, how do I do this? Um, not technically, but how do I do licensing or security in this field? And they were just cu cl clueless. <laughs> uh, Louis, I, I know you have strong views about copy left. How are you seeing that play into the specifically COVID related work? Um, you know, I that's I, I usually it's it's very rare that I would say the word open source, uh, and it's not because I don't like it. I think that I like to stress libre because it actually brings more the probably the significance about it. That doesn't mean that people that use the term open source is not doing libre software at the end of the day. It's just probably focusing more on the semantics of it and the philosophy behind libre software. Um, there was a project on one university um, that they came up with their own license. And, and it basically was, yes, you can download it, you can see the source code, but you cannot modify it. And that brings us to open science. And I believe that if I have an algorithm whether it's a bioinformatics or whether it's a defib or, or, or wherever in the medical field. Uh, science is based on collaboration or, or at least it should be. 
And if I can only download the software and not being able to modify it, then that is not Libre software. It's, it's, it's lacking one of the main key aspects of, of Libre software, which is I can download it, I saw a bug because, hey, every single piece of software has a bug. Karen has talked about this many times already on her talks. And it's, it's, it's proportional to the li number of lines, right? So, uh, you know, if, if this is something on bioinformatics or, or pharmaceuticals or whatever, the fact that I cannot contribute to it openly, uh, it's, it's, it makes it not libre anymore. So, especially today that we have very complex pieces of software and people say, yeah, but you can see the, the, the source code of it. Nobody has the time today to read millions of lines, you know, and those who have the time probably are the ones who are going to make a change and pinpoint where the issue is. And those are the exports. I mean, I, I, I think that we are so blessed by people like Richard Stallman or anybody behind the FSF that have given the humanity the possibility of, hey, I like your piece of software. Can I contribute to it? And you'll see that the quality or the end quality of that piece of software is proportional to the number of people who is actually working on it and not going in that sense. It's stupid. It's, so, Lois, it's selfish. I, I, I'm sorry to cut you off, but uh, uh, of course, um, we all here are, 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 are passionate and believe in Libre software, although in English, uh, I like to stick with software freedom as the general term because I think it's like super unambiguous, but it doesn't matter what we call it, right? We all agree as long as we're talking about the philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. But this, uh, the, the legal and policy dev room is one of the few places where we have a really advanced discussion. So like uh, most of our viewers will know about the reasons for freedom and, and, and really are, have that discussion already. So delve a little deeper and tell me like specifically, how does, how has, do you say the word copy left actively when you're promoting GNU Health and how has specifically the mechanism of copy left helped the promulgation of GNU Health to deal with COVID? Well, the example I put before in terms of somebody seeing what WHO gave the very last uh, uh, definitions or coding for COVID, or how can we actually uh, notify the health ministry of a new case or index case on COVID, that would have not possible if I have my software not being copyleft, meaning copyleft made COVID notification immediately because somebody could get into my software, modify it and publish with the new version and COVID and, and copyleft made possible also the fact of getting the latest news and uh, research from WHO and integrated into New Health. That would have not been possible, or at least not within the time frame that we wish to make it available for, for humanity. That's the importance of copyleft. It's freedom. It's you don't depend on anybody but yourself or your community to actually make a better world. And the, and the contrary also applies. Uh, so, Fabio, are you saying anything in particular about licensing issues as relates to, um, you know, in the respirator space that like looking at the respirator projects, uh, somebody sent me a, a, a seen a, a spreadsheet that catalogs all of them and there are so many of them all at different levels of advancement um, and very few of them are copy left and the ones that are copy left are not in a very advanced stage um, or uh, maybe uh, maybe they are they weren't in that reflected in that spreadsheet. Um, what do you what do you think about that? And could could copy left or other licensing choices better promote uh, free software in the health space? Um, yes, I, I feel it's really essential to to say the standard should be should be uh, like copyleft licenses 
uh, opening the code, uh, enabling people to uh, adapt it, to improve it. And I feel it's not only the, the software that is uh, the, the focus, but also all the equipment and all the infrastructure. Um, if uh, we, we take one of the interesting studies that was done by, by Winter, um, he did um, a comparison of open sourcing um, uh, MRI, so um, medical imaging scanners in Germany. And he said, if we, if like the, um, the suppliers of, of MRIs in Germany would share their, uh, their designs, their source code, uh, Germany could spare uh, at least 200 million euro per year. So uh, I think it's the license is, a, is an important point, but we must also see that if, if we open like the, the designs and the source code of, of what we are doing, we can reduce the cost, we can reinvest these costs in other like uh, areas, and we can also make the infrastructure, the equipment, the software affordable for countries where there is limited uh, resources. So uh, I think, yeah. That's why I like this. Um, I think either it's me or Fabio's network. It's Fabio. Okay. Yeah, I was I moving. I was shaking my head just to see if it was me. Yeah, actually. yeah, same, same. This is a, a, a the challenges of of panels in uh, during a remote the remote pandemic age, um, but we can. Uh, but, yeah, he'll be back, and he made some great points. Um, you know, I I I wonder like, and and. And Fabio touched on this in some of his remarks, but um, but the there's been a lot of coverage of how the deployment of medical solutions is really uneven amongst different populations, um, both globally and also um, also within geographic areas um, across socioeconomic lines. Free software has always had the promise of democratizing technology. It's the philosophy behind it is about giving everybody access to their source code and being able to customize their, their software for them to be able to be provided with opportunities that they wouldn't ordinarily. But often we see that um, that that this this doesn't play out always um, in the real world. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if if you've either of you have seen examples of free and open source software providing opportunities specifically during the COVID crisis that it, it wouldn't have otherwise, or areas where free software hasn't filled the role that you would have hoped that it would in order to democratize access to healthcare. Adriana, do you want to start? I'm sorry to pick on you first twice now. No, that, that's fine. Um... I just browse through my mind uh, if uh, during the last year um, I can come up with one specific example. I just thought that in the end it's still always about access. So there were many maker spaces in Germany that came up with, you know, 3D printing masks or whatever and distributing that. And, but then still you need to be kind of that community a part of that kind of community you need to have contact with those people or you need to be friends of friends or that, and that's difficult i think because sometimes we might we maybe forget that the tech community is still kind of small small like not many people interact with hacker spaces at least in germany and like my friends don't know them and and the parents of my friends don't don't know them so um I think there is a promise of distributing access to technology or, or distributing goods with technology more evenly in, in free software, but it might be a little more theoretical than we wish it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and probably also, you know, it, it's how how the state, how the public administration, how the legislators are going to actually join us in this endeavor. Because at the end of the day, um, when I put the case of Argentina, that that was the government itself who picked up Guido Health. But it's, it's, I would say that it's 
it's almost a re something strange because most of the time they come with some sort of very strong legislation when you talk about um, um, respirators, uh, you know, um, it's not very easy to actually go through all, you know, the, the quality assessment or whatever, if you are going in the open source or libre community, it's just not. Uh, and, and, and many times you have to put a lot of money up front to go through the process of actually being chosen. And, and, and the reality is most of, most of us don't have it. But if we have clear state or government legislation that say we are going to favor first libre software projects, um, like in the case of Argentina or like in the case of, of, of Jamaica or, or look at India. I mean, the largest hospital in Asia over 3,000 beds have chosen New Health. And, and, and if they chose New Health, it's probably, it's, it's good for the project, but it's good for the community itself. What is important here is, chances are they are going to choose Orthanc for DICOM images, and they are going to choose many other free software projects to meet their needs. And, and, and that is done in a public health hospital. And, and that is the importance of it. I think that when, when you see the Free Software Foundation Europe, uh, you know, working on this campaign of public money, public code, um, we really need more of those guys in Europe and in, chances are in the States. And, and uh, to make sure that our, our politicians actually legislate towards that uh, very important key part of making sure that the public administration uses uh, uh, public software and, and free software, actually, I would say. How, how do we close the gap? The, the problem is, or there are so many problems, right? Like, um, and and so many of us are, are working hard on these issues and there's a, a gap somewhat. Some of our projects are quite sophisticated. Some of our technology is sophisticated and ready, but a lot of it isn't. A lot of our you know, a lot of what we're, we're working on in the health space is somewhat theoretical. We know that if we have the ability to collaborate together, our software solutions will be better. We know that if we use free software, that ultimately, like, we don't have vendor lock-in, we don't have a lot of the bad outcomes that, um, that, that plague healthcare solutions across the world. But many of our free software solutions are not ready for prime time yet. They're not tested at the same scales already. How do we how do we convince governments to make policy when mo many of the solutions, not all of them, but many of the solutions we have are not ready turnkey right now? But you bring Karen, you bring a very important point here when you said many of the projects probably are not ready for prime time. I would say that not a single closed source project is ready for prime time because they are not secure. They are not they are not private, you know? So at least we might have something that they don't have, which is privacy in healthcare. How can we as, as, as a society um, trust these hospital management systems that you don't know what they are actually doing? Are they selling our information to the insurance companies? We don't know because when you are prescribing something, the patient is getting the prescription, but you don't know what's going behind the scenes on that black box. At least with Libre software, you have the choice to and the chance to see what's actually going on. And, you know, health and privacy, they go so much together that it's, it's, it doesn't fit in my mind how today we talk so much about encryption and public key infrastructures and blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the day, you don't know whether you have a keyboard sniffer in your operating system. So, you know, it's like the rest of the thing is not ready for prime time because it's closed source. It's so hard for me to play devil's advocate on this point because these are exactly the points that I would make if I were, these are exactly the points I would make. But um, but I think that, that while that's true and that only free software has the possibility of being 
secure over time and all software will have vulnerabilities, which makes proprietary software all the more dangerous and damaging. The, there is the reality that at this point, there are proprietary software solutions that have been subject to massive trials where the free and open alternatives have not. And so how do we engage in that conversation with policymakers to, to because I've, I've been in, I've sat in that chair and sort of said, think about it logically. Right, and here are some studies. We can talk about the honeymoon effect. We can talk about basic security principles. But at the end of the day, how how do we what do we say to them? How do we close that gap? I, I mean, the, the best argument already came up. You know, like privacy and health is like for everybody. Nobody wants to to share their most private data about your personal health with anybody else who has no permission to see it. But. but I fear in the end, hospitals make a decision also based on does I get like can I make this set this up quickly and does it run like without any problems? Or is it like it's super easy? Or do my workers just you know click two buttons and 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 you know it's like convenience um in the like for the user, maybe a little more up front than the privacy which you don't see but you see if it's messy and you don't know where to click i know this is this is silly but i think this is a really big point it is but for me it i is. feel like um you know there is this recommendation about open science that unesco is going to release in november so one of the points in it is to promote like uh, free and open source software and hardware so i think this will be helping us like push for this movement uh, in, in different governments. Uh, but I feel the question is also to say, or a, a change of mindset in policymakers and saying, okay, if you, if you buy for millions of proprietary licenses every year, you could also invest this money to uh, encourage uh, local communities to improve software that can be used by everyone over, uh, over the world. And then all countries could mutualize resources so that it benefits everyone. And not just thinking locally and saying, "Oh, I want to buy a, a this a software license and uh, it's useful for me." So uh, I think the mindset is really we should see how we can also encourage the development of of local skills, contributing to global projects. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, maybe an, another element is like there was these discussions about hospitals. Um, I think hospitals are focusing on disease management. Maybe there should also be a discussion about how to encourage communities to take ownership about their health, uh, not just managing diseases when they arise and finding technical solutions such as vaccines, but also investing in non-medical, uh, non-pharmacological solutions, in social solutions, in art therapy, in all approaches that reign over the people. So that's maybe another <laughs> another panel to organize. Oh, we could, I think we four could talk about this topic for hours and hours and hours. Um, so are you seeing, some of you have a, a very strong, act, I think all of you have strong experiences with um, with uh, dealing with policymakers, especially in talking about access to funds to forward this kind of work. Um, there have been several references to public money, public code, uh, which is a great initiative. And, you know, are you seeing more access to funds? Have you seen pandemic related funds being specifically um, allocated towards free solutions? And Lewis, your uh, your camera has turned off, um, which is fine. We know you're here now, but if you have the ability to turn it on, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lewis. Fabio, I, right? I, meant, I, meant, I meant Fabio. Fabio, your, your video oh. is off. Sorry, Lewis, your video is fine. <laughs> Yeah, but Fa Fabio's voice just came out of nowhere. <laughs> Coming from the uh, dark side. <laughs> <laughs> so, so who wants to start talking about um, uh, public funding or, or other pandemic related funding and how we're seeing that, um, whether there's access to that for free and open solutions or if there's uh, if there are challenges there? Um, in my case, or in our case, I would say that we we are very grateful, for example, here we have in the island of Gran Canaria, um, the um, 
that is a, a, a public entity um, with focus on uh, international solidarity, and they are one of our biggest donors, um, which fits very well on our social medicine program. Um, uh, but other than that, is I would say that is, or at least in general, is is quite hard to find um, public money put on, you know, except this particular case that I'm talking about on, on Genu Solidario uh, and the government of Gran Canaria. Uh, it's 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 quite hard. It's quite hard, probably because of what we were talking before that is. You know all the lobbies and, and all the stuff that goes around the public administration just focuses on 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 the big companies, or at least that's the way I see it today. Well, in uh, in Germany, it's complex, but I I feel like there's a, there's a general push towards funding more open source, and the pandemic. Um, speeded that up uh, or a little, um, but also like the big conservative party, Angela Merkel's party, they they had a resolution on public money, public code on one of their party meetings. Uh, and nobody expected that from the conservatives. So that was <laughs> like the whole open source or free software community was like, okay, wow, we didn't expect that from you, but here we are. Um, and then also what I saw was that the ministry that funds the prototype fund, and we're we're really small, we have 8 million euros for four years, like a, about 8 million euros. So it's not much, but they had um, 1.5 million that they just put into some of the hackathon projects because they said, we need those open source um, software projects now. And we just, you know, we have money, we spend it. And that was super fast. Like for a ministry, it took them three weeks and that everybody was uh, astonished. So what I see though, what is w pushing way more for free software than the pandemic is uh, the whole discourse around sovereignty, digital sovereignty. That is why people now look at oh, oh, like free software. And um, yeah, for, for everything like COVID related, there was a real struggle to make the uh, the app, like the tracking app, the German official tracking app, to make that a decentralized um, free software version and not a centralized proprietary software. And it, it like the whole community in Germany pushed for that. Uh, and they were successful, but it wasn't like super clear from the beginning that that's how we're going to do it. The government needed to be convinced that this is the right way to do it. So people can trust it and people actually use it. So I think the, it, it does give it a push and there is more money now in the system, but it's not all like thanks, thanks to COVID. Fabio, did you wanna? Um, I mean, I, I know a bit more the situation in Canada. Uh, and I feel like there is a move, like, for example, librarians in universities have been uh, at the forefront of trying to mutualize resources uh, going through this di digital transformation. And uh, there is also no a move from the federal government to, to say we, we need to make uh, public documentation available. We need to foster like collaboration across uh, ministries, across agencies. And they decided to first do a sort of a consultation uh, to create committees, and they are going to then define which resources they want to uh, to uh, dedicate to that. So that was a bit of criticism from the community saying, oh, uh, okay, we have this uh, plan for open science, but we don't have a budget. But it was thought that uh, first communities should say what the needs are, where, where, where solutions could be found, and then a budget could be allocated to that aim. So hopefully it will evolve in the next uh, year, I think. So I always like to think of free software as a long-term issue, right? Like if we talk about like all of the critical issues that we must work on in our day, you know, when you look at free software, it seems it seems more esoteric than some other causes that have immediate impact. Um, but we cannot ignore our long-term issues and free software is at the service 
of every other issue because every other issue needs to use software in order to resolve it. How are we, how, what do we, what should we learn from our experiences now that will make us ready as a movement for the next pandemic? Lewis, um, you've gotten the last word a few times, so you get the first word this time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, at the end of the day, we we have to start thinking on being a community, and um, so far we have been doing a very bad job on that. Uh, you see, being a, a physician, uh, I remember the very first days here in Spain, people at eight o'clock at night, they came out to the wind, uh, to the balconies and they were clapping the physicians and uh, uh, they forgot about it. And that is the reflect of our society. We are a selfish society. They were clapping there, not because they loved physicians, but they were saving their butts. And um, once that happened, they forgot about it and they, no longer have that, but not just the physician, the uh, the police, the educators. Um, I think we have to see again that I don't want to go back to the open source versus libre or whatever. Um, but the philosophy itself, I think that okay, you can, you can, but you only we... have a, a minute or two. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You can do it, but just a uh, few. Just re yeah, you no, only have what I'm five saying, minutes. What I'm saying <laughs> is. If we keep on just thinking and saying open source or, or libre software without actually helping or thinking about the philosophy of sharing and cooperation, we will not go far enough at all. And you can do that with your children and you can do that with our politicians, giving them a Python instead of an iPad. And if we do that, then we'll probably uh, We'll suffer a little bit at the beginning, but at the end, we'll have an, a nicer society. Fabio, what do we need to do long-term as a movement to make sure we're ready for the next pandemic? Yeah, um, I must uh, I don't agree with Luis uh, in regard that people are selfish. I think we're, there is the goodwill, uh, but the economy system is, is pushing for competition and, and uh, uh, the, the what do we say? Accumulation of resources. Uh, I think on the long term, we really need to say uh, it's not sufficient to bring together people to find solution, but we also need to take time to discuss how we are going to work together. And if, for example, we work for one week together, every day we should uh, give maybe 30 minutes or one hour to say, okay, what, what went good today? And how did we do well? And what was not working well? And how can we improve? And I feel that way, like the group will learn to become more mature and to work better together, to find better ways to uh, share resources, to document everything. Uh, and I feel that's the, that's the key point. So not focusing on, on the outcome, but really on the process of being together, of sharing, of maybe confronting different uh, positions and saying, yes, let's, let's create first some, some social belonging. And, and the technology is just the, uh, uh, a mean, uh, not not the goal. Absolutely, I agree with you on that. Yeah, that that would also have been my point actually. That the pandemic showed, still shows, that y no, yeah, no man or woman an island. So it doesn't really help you if you're doing well and everybody else suffers. That that doesn't do anything for you. You you have to take care. Of yourself and everybody else in order to to be well and, and good and I think that is a general learning not just for any tech community but for everybody to to understand okay we're way more interconnected than we thought and we already thought that we're interconnected but we're way more interconnected and we need to find models that focus way more on cooperation than competition and also we mm -hmm. saw in this pandemic that Competition doesn't always mean the best results. Sometimes it means waste of resources, longer time that we need to find a solution. Uh, so we need to, yeah, to change our mindset from 
competition means in the end we have the best as the winner to maybe cooperation means in the end more people win and it's better for everyone and better for me individual as well um and i think like this is a very big thing you know it's easy to say but how do you do that and i think maybe for for tech communities there's there's and everybody's preaching that also as well there's um the advice that the the more practice you have in working together with people from totally different backgrounds the easier you can come up with a good solution when it needs to be very fast like we had um nurses working with tech teams in the hackathon and, and they had the best idea in the end because they had both experts and they work together but it's not easy like i i'm not i'm not a tech person and finding the, the same language takes time you need to practice to speak the same language and if you only do that in the moment when you already need to work together it's frustrating so we need to learn the different languages of everybody so cooperation does really work i want to thank okay. all three of you you're doing amazing work it is beyond a pleasure to be able to sit down with you and have this conversation. I'm sad that we're not in person so we could discuss this more. Um, but I'm also sad that we're not in person so that you can't hear the applause of the audience when we get to the end of this. So thank you so much for joining us. And I hope we continue the conversation over the next few months and years. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Gunning. Thanks a lot. Thank you. See you. Bye, Fabio. See you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> see you guys. Bye. See you. I'll keep talking about how we're live until we're live. <laughs>All right, we are live with our Q and A. Um, thank you so much for uh, for joining me again. Um, the questions that got the most upvotes in the um, in the chat uh, are well, well. We'll see how many we can get to, but let's start with the first one, which is that um, uh, there's a question that says that we have um, a lot to bridge the gap um, uh, for security and privacy, and that there are huge digital literacy gaps. Um, do either of you want to start talking about that? Um, yeah, okay, I, I can start maybe. Um, I feel like one, one huge gap is really to empower people in helping them make decisions together instead of polarizing uh, discussions. And I feel that goes through transforming education. So today we are still in, a, in an education um, model where uh, it's top down, where teachers think for the students what they are going to, to, to learn and how. And I think there are others model, other models that have been working well where we take into account people's experience people knowledge to create together and i feel if if we start from childhood uh encouraging children to to learn how to decide how to learn how to work together uh this will, this will also impact like uh, the future so yeah please do you have yeah yeah I, I i fully agree with uh, fabio um yeah, just to give you an example, in Africa, um, in the whole continent, there are so many countries where health professionals still don't know, um, you know, the um, WHO ICD coding for diseases. Um, in a very global world, uh, it, you know, if, if we cannot train our colleagues in this very basic stuff, uh, how can we share information among our patients um and and yeah education is key here you know uh, and that comes back again to public education and public health uh, policies that's right and i want to stress that uh, that we mean education all around and that we're not simply talking about educating kids um, because digital literacy can be achieved in any age and you know i think especially when it, it concerns health I think that um, we can we can do better um, than simply saying this is a problem we can fix in the future, although we certainly have a good chance of fixing it in the future. Yeah. Uh, I just read a, an article saying 
we we are thinking that uh, young people know how to how to uh, use computers but apparently there are many young people that are just using their phones and they don't know how to write the text online and so on so i i feel like yeah people should be aware about how to use technologies but also about all the ethical and and uh, societal questions that come with them so. well i think it segues nicely to the next question which is um you know what are your views uh, um, the most, what are, what do you think is the most crucial policy challenge for, um, you know, for uh, free and open source software and hardware and healthcare? Um, and, uh, you know, how does that relate to medical device regulations that you have experience with? So, Luis, do you want to start? Um, I think that in, in terms of uh, Libre Software, we've been doing much better in the last years. Um, many or some countries at least are now embracing uh, Libre software in public health, which is great. Um, uh, you know, we have uh, things like uh, HL7 Fire, uh, which is a way of sending messages across different health institutions and devices uh, being fully, fully open. Um, I think that in terms of uh, uh, open or libre hardware, we are a bit behind. But again, uh, I think that you know there is such a huge uh, road to uh, complete in terms of legislation and, and put clear um, uh, policies in terms of giving libre software projects an advantage in terms of uh, being adopted in the public administration in general and in particular in the um, public health uh, section. Um, I would say we, we have to hack the law and be aware that the law is, is something we create together. It's not something that uh, is right or, or wrong. Uh, I think we can look back at constitutions and see like, in, for example, in Italy, in other countries, there have been uh, um, courts deciding and, and uh, supporting that the multitude prevails over decisions made by representatives. So no, I think we rely a lot and medical professionals rely a lot on regulations that are very strict, that are uh, uh, disempowering us for, for creating together. And we, had, we have to find a way to, to go around it, maybe saying, okay, if people create their own devices, uh, then we don't need to um, have this uh, validation of quality that comes from an external authority. Maybe we can uh, encourage um, the community to take ownership of these questions and decide collectively what they want to do. And then we can we can support that with participatory research, with creation as research. So with uh, an agile way of, of, uh, of doing research that is a bit more uh, adequate today. I think we might have time to hit one more question, which is that, um, uh, one of our audience members commented that um, that from their experience in attending hackathons, that it was frustrating that humanitarian and community organizations that could help with the sustainability component of this work um, just didn't couldn't or didn't join, whether they were overwhelmed or there was a lack of common language. How do we um, how do we bridge that gap um, and make sure that we get all the parties in the room to create the solutions that we think could be effective in a free and open way? 